Oh, yes. This is the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. And today's show, sponsored by Cheshire Impact, on a mission to help people maximize their use of Pardot and Salesforce. CheshireImpact.com. Bam. Just like that. No fanfare, oh, no wow. trumpets, but it's live and we're cranking. My guest today, I'm excited to introduce you to him. He is a marketing leader, a revenue marketer, but I got to tell you, he's got experience in sales and marketing, which I've always said makes the best of either the sales side or the marketing side. And he's got experience in both the analytical side as well as, you know, biz dev roles, you know, driving in cars to conferences, feet in the street, getting it done um, across B2B and B2C, lots of work in the banking industry. Um, and he actually has a specialty of working with decision makers of all levels to implement digital marketing automation strategies and CRM systems, which is near and dear to my heart, as you all know. So we're going to be having a great conversation today. Director of Marketing at Integrated Financial Holdings, Andrew Schaefer. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Casey. Really excited to be here. Uh, appreciate the kind words. Uh, too kind. Just too kind. <laughs> right? Well, I, I set the bar high, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> here so we go. We, now we got we got to get there, but there's so many things to talk about, and um, and I just so I just need to shut up over here, and I'm gonna pass you this. It's heavy, but you look like a strong, strong fellow. So here it is. Ugh. All right, you got it. Okay, nice. Yeah, safe double hand grab. That was good. Good. So take Thor's hammer, smash for me some kind of marketing myth, bogus strategy, misconception. Just set the record straight once and for all. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, biggest myth today, uh, from my perspective, is the notion that anyone can market, right? And I want to start by unpacking that a little bit more for the listeners of this show, right? B2B marketers who may have spent you know, their entire lives studying this field, um, becoming experts in marketing, and they might say, well, Gee, thanks, genius. <laughs> I'm fully aware that <laughs> not anyone can market, right? right? I'm learning something new every day as a marketer, right? With so many tools and so much noise out there. I mean, um, it's kind of obvious that not anyone can market to those listening to this show. Um, you know, and technically, when you look at this myth, anyone can market, right? You just have people that do it poorly and people that do it well, whereas right. not anyone can write code, right? If you put code in front of me, I wouldn't know where to even start, right? So not right. anyone can do that. So unpack that, address it head on first that, you know, in the context of who's listening to this show, um, wanted to kind of just lay that out there first. Yeah, but well said. Why it's a myth to me, um, I think it's really a generational thing, right? So um, you have millennials and Gen Z, right? Who are a little bit more quicker to adapt to all the different noise that's out there, all the different tools, all the different technologies that play a role in marketing, right? Yeah. Whereas you might have baby boomers and Gen X folks that may associate marketing with that of what was going on in the 60s, right? With like mad men, right? They're sitting around their, their living room drinking scotch, coming up with ideas, being creative, right? Like <laughs> that to me is kind of like where what my father, for example, might think of marketing. Right. Wait, and are you telling um, me you don't have some scotch with you right now? I don't know. I mean, I've, you know, there's no liquor cabinet in this office. Me you know, neither. we're, Man, we're, we're boring. <laughs> no, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> um, got to keep that locked up. Um, right. so, so yeah, so there's um, no, that a mad men thing. It's not. Yeah. So it's really, you know, and the reason I say it's generational is, um, when I used to do sales at Windsor Advantage, we used to sell SBA lending solutions to community banks and credit unions. So a lot of times I'd be on the phone with upper level management decision makers at these smaller community banks. They may be in their you know, 50s or 60s. And we'd start talking about their SBA lending strategy to originate loans because Windsor would not get paid until their banks and credit unions actually started closing SBA loans. So gotcha. that was a topic of conversation often. I'd say, you know, talk to me about your strategy. How are you originating deals? How are you, how do you want to grow volume? And oftentimes they would, you know, say, well, go talk to our executive admin who does all our marketing. Nothing against executive admins whatsoever. But what it told me is you had management and decision makers at these banks 
that did not think it was important enough to de dedicate a role to marketing, right? A sole role with an expert in that field. Yeah. Um, you know, and furthermore, um, I actually got this idea for this myth, uh, talking to my dad, <laughs> right? A, a generational yeah. thing. So, um, you know, he, his company, they do manufacturing for construction equipment. And we were talking some marketing and sales strategy sometime within the last couple of years. And, you know, he said, the guy who does all of our business development also does our marketing. And he said, well, he understands business development and really anyone can market was a statement he said, you know, and he, he said, because he knows business development, well, he can just do marketing and figure it out. Anyone can really do it. And looking back at it, I really should have said, you know, why is that? Like I, and I just, it resonated with me as like a guy in sales and marketing and has having experience in both these, I, I just was like, well, that just seems like there's a disconnect, right? Because it, it's so dangerous to have this as a myth when you have management and decision makers that feel a certain way, because then it supports this spray and pray mentality of well, if we're posting things on LinkedIn or if we're writing a blog, then we're marketing, right? But what doesn't that, that type of activity do, right? It doesn't yeah. address who's the target audience, what do they think about their challenges, right? How do they perceive their challenges? How do we want them as marketers to think about their challenges? And then why should they believe the message that we are giving them about their challenges and how our company or our product or solution can solve those challenges, right? So when you're not doing those things, you're not being highly targeted and you're not giving your audience a compelling message, right? To convince them of what it is you have to offer, right? So I'll give you a quick example of, um, you know, going back to Windsor, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's a quick example of where you have the same product and the same target audience, but two very different journeys as far as these questions that, you know, need to be addressed or concerned. So you, Windsor Advantage selling SBA lending solutions, same product, two banks, right? Um, right. Furthermore- in, 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 To your point, and you said this, but it, now it clicks with me. The reason you were calling them is because if they weren't able to sell and market properly, they weren't fully utilizing your services. And so you needed them to be successful in order for you to get paid. Precisely. Right. We okay. needed, because we weren't brokering those loans, right? We weren't giving them an SBA loan on a silver platter saying, go process, go right. process this, close the loan so we can get paid. We had to teach them how to identify an SBA transaction gotcha. and what kind of, um, nuances were involved to be able to fit a certain product, right? Because the SBA program uh, is very compliance driven, right? The government guarantees a large portion, mm. typically 75% of these loans. So in the event they go bad, the SBA will actually guarantee that loan. In order to do that, you have to dot all your I's, cross all your T's, make sure you're doing them right. So that's why Windsor had a business model. Got it. Um, to be able to provide those compliance processing servicing solutions for banks. So um, in looking you know, at this example where you, you know, you're, you're selling this outsourced solution to banks, right? You have clients and non-clients, right? You, you want your clients to do more volume, more so you want non-clients to just understand the benefits of SBA lending. Only a fourth right. of banks in the country even do SBA loans. So it's like, here's all the benefits, right? increase fee income, increase liquidity, you know, serve new underserved markets. Um, so same product, you're selling it to clients specifically, right? Like, let's say you're just yeah. wanting clients to go do more loans. Yeah. Well, you have two types of clients then. You have high volume clients and low volume clients. How do those two different types of audiences think, right? The high volume clients might think, well, I need to be better about compliance and making sure our processes are airtight, right? We have a lot, we have a large portfolio, auditors are going to be in here, right? Um, whereas the low volume clients, how do they think? Well, they might just be thinking, I need to find centers of influence and understand SBA loans more so I can generate volume, right? So you're selling a product to yeah. clients that think 
two like very, two different, very different ways, ways right, right? Yeah. and then you go down to the next layer well how do we as windsor want them to think the high volume clients but we want them to to think that windsor can help them prepare for audits get them trained help coach them whereas the low volume clients might be you know we would want them to think windsor can make introductions to various cois and help train them on how to identify a transaction right gotcha. and then the final layer to that is why should they believe it well windsor has the experience with audits for the high volume we can do this low volume windsor has exposure to various origination sources right windsor works with a hundred different banks in the country so hey what are these other banks doing right. as part of their strategy so just just an example of two very different pathways and two very different journeys with the same product and this really the same audience right when you look at it and say it's a bank who's a client yeah. um so that you know just wanted to walk through that because it might be helpful for you know saying why you know it's so important that not anyone can market and you need to kind of smash this and go through different examples and really executive management does need to understand these different journeys yeah right so you know in doing so it will allow them to put the right people in the right seats at their company that then have the ability to reach the right people and form the right connection along the way through this um journey or marketing funnel right so it's important to understand those messages and really unpack them and um, be very targeted along the way. So yeah. as opposed to just putting something on LinkedIn, like it's national hot dog day, right? Yeah. Or, or get your mortgages today, get your SBA yeah, loans right get, today. Get SBA <laughs> right? Like who's that resonating hot with? dog and chips, mm -hmm. right? It, stop by, stop yeah. by our booth for, for a chance to win a refrigerator magnet. I see too much of that, like yeah. on LinkedIn these days. Yeah. And, and that's even, you know, this is a great point, right? And, and as you, this, there's so many things to unpack here with this, but even this one example, you had two, you know, is, is exact same target, but there, there's a segmentation challenge there. If you talk to the wrong person, the wrong way, they're just going to either not, you know, best case, they're just ignoring you. Worst case, they're like angry at you for treating them like the wrong thing. And so the, the, the idea of ha these executives having a placeholder in marketing, having someone right. just to like, hold the fort, like do whatever. I don't know what you need to do, but you're, you're going to make flyers for us now. And even in the conversation with your dad, that biz dev person had a different job. It was like, go shake hands, kiss babies, hand out lollipops, it, nothing to do with marketing, but we need to, you can, you can hold that too. Right. And right. so when you have these, when you consider it like a placeholder, like, I guess like you got to check the box to have some, some flyers and some hot dogs at your next event then that's when you, you get these very inaccurate messages and you really miss the point, right? Organizations mm -hmm. that, that miss this, they're not growing. I mean, and if you are, it's because you're, you're spending, I don't know. I don't know if you can grow at that point. I don't know how you compete in a world where your message is just not on target because you're not even thinking about it, right? Like Stacey doesn't have time to think about what this message should be. You need someone in marketing to say like, what are these, you listed it. You know, what are they thinking about? What are the challenges? Who are these people? And what do we want them to think about the situation? Right. How right. And I think it, you know, going back to that example, um, just the dangers of the reactive approach and the dangers of just marketing when you need to market, like right. it's almost being desperate, like, yeah. oh gosh, we need to close more loans or we need to do more deals. So let's just go market that, that to me, it looks desperate and it's almost just, a, a, it's, it, it's bad, right? Yeah. I mean, it feels like it feels like auto sales, you know, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. all that stuff just feels like last minute. You know, maybe they're just trying to do the urgency thing too, but just feel it doesn't. You don't actually know me. You're not actually targeting anything. You're just like you got stuff and flags, and it's like cheese. And, and then you see it most with like the smaller dealerships, where probably a similar situation. They're not really thinking about who drives a jeep. Who drives an Audi, right? Who like, no, right. they're just like, we got cars, you got a butt and a foot for the pedal. <laughs> let's go. Right. But that, that, I mean, how many times we see car commercials and we just like, oh God, not a, you see one car commercial, you've seen them all. And then the worst there's like when it's like a family run dealership, you're like, oh God, don't put your, your kids on the screen. Like this it has nothing to do with the person who's going to be behind that wheel. It's just such a, right. a miss. Right. Right. I mean, it's, and it's obvious too, like you, people, 
know when they're being sold to and they know oh, when yeah. they start to feel uncomfortable versus, hey, I know when I see something that addresses something that I'm struggling with right now. Right. I mean, us as consumers, it's so blatantly obvious, right? And especially with like, you know, the concept of retargeting, right? I mean, this is a whole nother can. <laughs> sure. But, you know, on, on social media, when you see something that you were looking into the night before or trying to do some research on and you think, wow, this might be a better way. Or, hey, here's a product that um, isn't exactly what I was looking at last night but it might be a cheaper solution or something I hadn't thought about before, right? Like marketing almost gives people ideas that they didn't even know were in their head oh, yeah. because it's so retargeted. And so, um, so that, to, that to me is obviously more effective than, hey, does your butt fit in this seat? Okay, cool. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure you get this car. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've always felt that with like Instagram ads. I don't know if you've ever bought anything off of Instagram. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think what, what um, is it, right? my wife and I, I think joke like once a week that, um, oh yeah, I got targeted last night again and just, you know, bought the uh, bark box for our dog. Right? There it like, is. <laughs> it, it was like, she was looking for a new collar or something and then bark box. Well, I didn't even know we needed this, but instead of getting toys for the dog, like, <laughs> per, you know, periodically because he ruins them all, then you can just get a box once a month. It's like the, the shave club just comes yeah. to you in the mail and it's all, all ready right, for your so dog. I can the see toy. the wheels turn and you're going to yeah. go buy the bark box. I don't know if you have a dog, but All right, we'll look this, look this shit up. <laughs> yeah. And how are they mm -hmm. going to attribute the revenue to this show? I don't know. Uh, um, ch Hardcore marketing sponsored by bark box. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks bark box for your yeah. donation. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, so it's your, the, the earlier point of Instagram, it, I feel like they, they do a good job of even on the consumer side of thinking like, Oh, who are, these people, what and what do we really want to target them? For some reason, it feels more thought out than like Facebook, which I've ignored for like the last ten years. Like I don't mm -hmm. even look at those ads anymore. Um, mm -hmm. I actually went out of my way one time to get them to be more targeted. How <laughs> I started liking things on Facebook that were more like mountain climbing stuff and REI. Like, please, someone target me with something accurate, so it's not just wasting my time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Instagram seems to have me figured out. They're like, oh. You like this stuff and this stuff? Cool. We got your number. And one time I bought like two things rapid fire. I'm like, yeah, I need that. Or yeah, I want that. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I got to get off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, stop. But, but they've got it figured out. And, and I love that you brought up the being sold to thing because um, when it, when it's targeted, when it, it is addressing something that you is probably a need or want, it doesn't feel like you're being sold to. I mean, yes, you are, but it's helpful, right? It's helpful as opposed to just being like, oh, a as an afterthought, there's this car, you don't really need it, but here it is. Um, you're, you're, to your point, you're a high volume client. We're speaking your language. We know exactly what your challenge is and we're going to address it. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And it's not as easy as it sounds to as marketers, right? Because we're not the ones on the front lines having these conversations with prospects typically. Right. Whereas, you know, you talked about in the beginning of, of the introduction, being able to connect sales and marketing together is critical to really understand both the sales process, having those conversations with customers, yeah. understanding their challenges, just being a genuine human being and having a conversation. Whereas you go behind the scenes and you get all analytical and you start figuring out ways to connect with more of those folks. I mean, Bridging that gap is so important and it's not as easy, you know, for, for marketers to really go into the shoes of a salesperson. So one of the things that, you know, we're doing at IFH to really extract these, these, you know, critical areas to be able to market effectively from department heads, right? Because IFH integrated financial holdings, we have six wholly owned subsidiaries. And then one of which is a community bank that really focuses pretty heavily in, in four main areas. So um, we have 10 different department heads, right? The, mm. the diff of the different entities and then the, the four verticals. And every quarter we send a department head a PDF fillable form that talks about their goals, right? So, you know, what do you really want to achieve this quarter? And then in the context of those goals, we start to extract answers to those questions. Who's the target audience in the context of this goal? Right. How do they think in the context of this goal or this, you know, solution that we have to offer? And you kind of just go down the funnel that way. Right. So when you're talking about a goal, as long as we can understand a lot of these things as marketers, 
then we don't need to necessarily be the ones having those conversations on the front line mm. as a business development person, right? So that's one of the ways that we've tried to get information from department heads um, to be able to market effectively. That's that's amazing. And is it once a month or once a quarter that you once a them? quarter, once, once a, a quarter. quarter? And do they fill it out? And how do you get them to mm-hmm. fill it out? <laughs> uh, I just give them a deadline. Say send this to me by you know you know X date. Usually give them a week. And it's you know it's a two page form, so it's not like it's anything crazy. They've got priority goals where they've got like their absolute must goal for the quarter. Talk about their goal in like two sentences, wow. right? And then there's drop downs with these different questions in the context of the audience and how they think and what their challenges are for each goal. Wow. Right. So then you prioritize goals. You understand what those goals are from the top down and us as marketers then have what we need to do our job to go help meet those goals. Tell me more about this. This is really cool. I, I, you know, you hear a lot about sales and marketing alignment, but something as simple as fill this thing out. And, and I think sometimes we get kind of skeptical, like, no, they're not going to fill that out. But if they see the value in what you do and that you doing something that actually supports their goals, I mean, that's, that's it. So you, um, what's it, what's a little, it's two pages and you've got like, what's your goal? What's your main goal? And then tell me about, you're asking about the challenges their customers have. Is that kind of like buyer persona research kind of thing? You're asking almost like content research as well. Like what, what are the questions? Right. So, um, you know, if, you know, our mortgage department has a goal, our, our department head says, okay, my absolute must goal is to find a new Coast Guard association to partner with and market to their members because Coast Guards have to move every four years. Right. And that's a huge opportunity for a mortgage lending division, right? If they have, you know, an audience, a captivated audience of a thousand members and an, an a Coast Guard association group, they're eventually going to have to move again too. So it's recurring. Um, Let's say that's her goal, right? And then right. you say, okay, just describe that goal a little bit more. Unpack that. They they fill it in in the field, um, in the free form field, and then they mm-hmm. have drop downs for like who's the target audience. Well, it's more so a center of influence, right, or a strategic partner, right? Yeah. And there's different drop downs for like direct consumer, center of influence, um, you know, B two B. So it's. Wow. Uh, strategic partner center of influence is the coast guard right because that's who we're going after right right and then how do they think or what challenges do they have right well what are their challenges they just want to provide value added you know solutions for their members that really you know help them make moving easier when it is time to relocate so um you know that's just an example of like the first one and then you know what are their challenges like how do we want them to think well we want them to think that west town bank and trust has a team of mortgage lenders that specialize in va loans specifically right veteran right. affair loans for coast guards um and then you just kind of keep going down right so wow. that's just one example but then on the form you have like the absolute must goal yeah where you do this and then you have a very important goal where you do this and then you have an important goal and then you have nice to have right so depending on what quarter it is it's like of the 10 department heads i'm always trying to make sure we get you know we achieve the absolute must goal on every one of those forms for each department every quarter whereas you know because then at the end of the quarter you say well we're providing the support we need and here's what we've agreed on like here's the form that we talked about and it just creates a little bit more conversation too i mean a lot of times someone will fill out the form and this is fairly new we've been doing it for like six months so Mm -hmm. a lot of you know People, especially in the beginning, would fill out the form and say, I didn't really understand this. Let's talk about it more. But then we get on a call and I say, well, I don't think this is really the target audience here, right? Wouldn't it be this person? Because this is kind of who we're wanting to influence more. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 just, wow. it's a way to be targeted, not do spray and pray and support their needs while also prioritizing what needs are the most important. What a cool way of organizing that conversation back and forth and yeah i can see early on you you get some people but to manage that many different internal customers really i this almost seems like a must because at least you get them all in and you're like okay we got to get the top goal for all these people if it makes sense or we we push back we try to you know rejigger it but then you're able to like map them all out like and then 
man, you're busy. Like how, how do you it's, serve? Like, would you say six, eight different groups all sending top goals and then they got secondary goals and all those things. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I think setting the precedent too of, you know, we're working on a lot of things this quarter and sometimes the department head will send me four things, four goals and they'll be like, these are all very important though. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's, uh, let's figure out which one's the most important of the all right. very important goals. So, right. <laughs> um, because we're, you know, just a few years ago, our holding company didn't have a marketing department. So, um, you know, I came on board like a year and a half ago and now we just have two dedicated guys at the company to marketing um, myself and another so it's not like we have the capacity to help 140 you know employees with all things everything marketing right um, not yet but i could easily see those departments championing for like look when he gets our goal done it's great we want him to get like all four of them done <laughs> we can't so how hey. can we contribute to making this group bigger so that we can mm -hmm. all get you know, that's, yeah. that's awesome. I could see that just organically growing the team. I mean, fast forward, you know, we, we chat next year and you're like, yeah, we got 30 people. It's working. It's like, you know, well, wow. fingers crossed, fingers crossed. But that's you know, awesome. one of the things it definitely does is it gets them to think from a different angle, yeah. right. In the context of their audiences too. Right. And that's one of the things, you know, um, when I presented this to management and they said, well, this is great because now our department heads, you know, this challenges them to think differently and mm -hmm. really like asking them the right questions about these things. Right. It just, it, yeah. it's beyond just like helping them with their marketing, but it's also like teaching them how to market and what's effective. Yeah. And specific too. It's not like, yeah, get me more customers. It's like, okay, well, let's talk about a specific project with a start and finish that we can go after. Um, yeah. With a smart goal, not just like a, yeah, more of that, please. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You, you, you like your, it's like you're training your, your customer to think in a certain way. So this is all online too. So it's like an online form that they're filling out with drop downs or we're still archaic, man. We're <laughs> us as marketers. It's our job to be innovative. I know, but right. it's, it's a PDF just fillable form that, oh, you know, okay. I made. Yeah. That's fair. So that's fair. As long as maybe, awesome. maybe you're given, yes. you know, maybe one day it'll be software focused and be this next big thing, but you, you know, like we're, we're, we're still testing it. A... Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, sick. Okay. Well, no, I mean, even PDF is better than you filling up, you know, getting a bunch of papers, crinkled papers with coffee stains on them from some oh, department yeah. head mm -hmm. or something. Right. Man, and going um, back to the generational thing where people are writing in cursive and giving you paper. I haven't seen right. that in a while. So at least it's on, you know, a computer. <laughs> yeah. Let me circle back to that, um, that you brought it up. What has been the approach when you have your dad, my dad, actually real quick story. My grandmother once driving in the car with her, you know, she's super old. She's forgetting stuff. And my brother's next to me, next to her and I'm next to her. And, and she's like to my brother, what do you do for a job? Right. And he's, he's a, at the time he was a cop. So he's like, I'm a police officer. She's like, Ooh, that's cool. She's like to me, what do you do for a job? And I'm thinking, Oh man, how do I describe digital marketing at the time? And so I was like, uh, we, we help people sell things on the internet. Um, she's like, Ooh, that sounds very, you know, smart and very complimentary. Right. <laughs> um, but then yeah. sure enough, like something like, um, probably 15 minutes ago, you know, how grandma brings up the same conversation again. Hey, uh, what do you guys do? Uh, you know, my brother, what, what do you do for work? No wait, wait, no, you're a police officer, right? <laughs> she remember that back to me, right? Wait, what do you do though? I don't remember what you do again. I was like, ah, mm -hmm. oh, I know. So, yeah. so what is your approach with? with helping change the mindset of the older or just the haven't adopted marketing generations and, and types of folks who don't know any better. How, how do you get them on your side? How do you get them to understand the power of marketing? How, and how did you do that? And what, what do you recommend people do? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one good example is SEO, like just the power of Google, because there's, people hear SEO, they might start reading about it, right? Yeah. That don't understand it. And they'll be like, whoa, that's way too complicated for me. There's, mm -hmm. you know, thousands of algorithms that Google uses. But one of the things that, you know, we did in addition to rolling out these forms where you walk through the goal and then these different drop downs that kind of, you know, move someone down a funnel or why a piece of content is important 
for that goal, um, that, you know, light bulb starts to go off, right? Like all the different marketing layers and onion, like peeling back the onion, right? Yeah. So they start to see that. But um, going back to SEO, I think, you know, we, we've done a couple of blog posts where, you know, you do some, some keyword research, where's that, um, you know, high enough volume, but not competitive phrase that's long tailed yeah. that we really want to target with a piece of content. Um, and we've created some blogs in the last six months um, that targeted phrases. And then, you know, you type them into Google. That's all you have to do to show management, look, this costs nothing other than us doing the research on this content. And it's brought, you know, 90 different organic clicks to our site. So for example, we did an article, uh, I think like last August, um, targeting the keyword phrase hemp business opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. um, because if someone is looking to maybe start a hemp business um, or learning about that concept, they're probably going to need a bank at some right. point right. Um, to bank them as a hemp company. So, uh, and, and it adds value to kind of learn about, you know, what are the nine different things that entrepreneurs in the hemp space are really interested in or where are the yeah. trends in, in this concept heading? So. Um, you know, that was one of the phrases we targeted with a piece of content. And now we rank number one on Google for that when people search it. And if I think, you know, last I looked, we had like something like 93 or organic searches for that exact term and clicks. So, I mean, just doing that and showing like our president. Wow. It's You're like, literally wow. number one. Yeah. I mean, it's just doing something like that and showing someone, then they're like, that's, that's great. That's easy. All I had to do was type that into Google and you say, okay, here's all the traffic. Then they're like, whoa, okay. I get it now a little bit. Right. <laughs> um, the hell? I'm looking like, and you got two ads above you and those guys have to pay for what you're getting for free. Wow. Wow. So man. I think that was one of the ways I, I did it with management in the beginning. It's just, you know, getting on a call or a Skype or screen share, typing a couple other phrases uh, into Google. Like I think loans for engineers should still be one. Um, and there's several others, right? So I think the power of Google and just being able to kind of be methodical in creating content and targeting the right phrases and then showing people how you're doing um, helps. Um, showing, you know, I, anyone can really get the concept of, uh, increases in LinkedIn followers. And uh, so it's like, hey, you know, last quarter we had this many, this, you know, this quarter we have this many, here's the number of pieces of content we did this quarter versus last quarter. And here's why, you know, upward trends are all aligned. Um, just doing things simple like that to me is just a, a good way to allow someone else to get it. Yeah. How long did that hemp banking uh, take? Was it the article, uncontested? So you're able to your point, the research, it was like not really that competitive. So you're able to just like poof, really nail it or. Yeah. I mean, it was, I don't know, probably just a couple weeks of kind of, and like, I go back and forth on some of these, you know, I keep a, um, there, you know, I, I set up Google alerts with mm. like maybe 40 of our key terms or products or phrases or different, you know, the 2018 uh, farm bill or safe banking act or, you know, huge legislation pieces as far as it relates to hemp banking, right? So having some of those key terms set up in my Google alerts, um, you know, I start wow. to get other ideas on the web when I see things. So I try to make it a best practice every morning to get the Google alert with all our different terms. You know, I scroll it, scroll through it on my iPhone. And if I see a headline that looks intriguing or is really applicable to us at IFH, I flip that email to my work email. I go in and I kind of keep like a, a Pinterest board of all the different articles that I'm starting to like target and like, mm -hmm. and really get something out of in an Excel file. And I think I got, you know, something similar to this in a Google alert that then I kind of circled back on when it was time to strategize and put together the content calendar and said, okay, here's something we can start to work with and um, mold as far as it relates to you know, organic search traffic based on these terms kind of thing. Yeah, that's killer, man, dude, super impressive. I'm, and I'm, you know, and I recommend everyone Google's, what was that phrase? Hemp banking. Um, great example. Cause in Westtown bank pops up and you have industry solutions slash hemp and the headline, I mean, so oftentimes we, you see ads or you see, you know, people are trying to target stuff and their headline just speaks nothing to what the search was. But this, it's like hemp banking has challenges. We have solutions. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt there's like regulations, there's red tape, there's 
unknown, but like if you've got known solutions, that's that's a key step for setting up a business. You just need to have a bank that you can squirrel away the the funds at. So, and then I also see like hemp banks here as like a brand registered, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. killer man. And, and you're like zeroed in on something. And so I could see, you know, these small, small, not even small, these wins, these like quick wins, if you will, more immediate wins. You don't have to wait, you know, the nine months or next year, we'll have some results for you, like some quick wins to show people that, you know, if you, if you wave your, your eye or Sauron in the right direction, that'll, it'll bless whatever it, it comes across. So I could see that, you know, earning you some props there. And, and that buys you the, the, the buy-in to buys you the buy-in it gets you the buy-in to be able to make some more changes or ask them to fill out a form because you're able to show some results from it absolutely absolutely Sick. yeah i think it's it's um yeah i mean just it's the power of google man it's everyone gets typing something into google um so i think it's kind of it's it's ironic to center you know your approach to yeah. teaching people uh marketing right around SEO, one of the more complicated things out there. Yeah. So there's some irony to that for sure. Have you, have you tried doing um, some PPC on that same search ad? Or the we same have not, search no, list? we're, we're getting into a lot of that this next year, right? The, the yeah. first year, the first year, cause I was hired in late 2019 um, at Westtown Bank Corp at the time, which was the holding company of Westtown Bank and Trust. And we rebranded to integrated financial holdings as the result right. of um, you know, acquiring a few different other financial services companies along the way. Um, so really that first year was more so redoing the website, rebranding, figuring out what our message is going to be, how it's going to like be a compelling message to our targeted audience, right? And just kind of getting all that in place. And now, you know, we're really starting to hit the ground on what are your goals as far as being proactive to market, right? Like within the last six months and developing content that's very methodical and like, works people down the marketing funnel and really being a little bit more proactive with our advertising and, yeah. um, and, and those things. So that is where we're, we're definitely headed um, as far as just like wanting to get the, get the name out there more. Totally. And, and to your point, you're paying zero for, per click right now. So that's a sweet place to be. Um, I'm looking at the two ads, at least that I see. And one of them is generic. Um, they don't, they don't even mention hemp in the ad, like fail super fail and the other one does so it'd be interesting to see if you if you've got top seo and and you know second ppc you're you're taking up most of the real estate on that page mm -hmm. i mean the the industry with hemp too it's kind of like shooting fish in a barrel right now because you've got all these you know different that's different legislation that's in limbo right now as far as um you know the the safe banking act and sure um, there's a lot of question marks out there and a lot of banks have, you know, flat out said, we were not interested in banking this market. Well, it's, it's growing at a significant rate um, and pace. And, you know, if I think the latest FinCEN report, um, you know, had close to, you know, if there's 12,000 banks and credit unions based in the US, I want to say it had like something a little over like 700 in total that were actually raising their hand and saying we bank at least one hemp related business because wow. it became legal and with the 2018 farm bill, um, you know, in late 2018. So that was really the impetus for Westtown wanting to get into the space and, yeah. and really taking the time to figure it out and go through the compliance and due diligence, due diligence aspects to have a, you know, airtight program. But, um, you know, it, that's like 5% of banks and credit unions that even do this. Mm. So when you have a growing industry, right, that's just exploded. Yeah. And so few Jeez. like lenders doing this, right. Being able to offer these solutions for these companies, it's, it's like they're, they're looking for someone they can trust. They need a banking right. partner that knows the industry that has done this right. Because where a lot of banks go wrong is they take this don't ask, don't tell approach mm. where they're like, oh, you're a hemp company. Okay. I just want the business. I'm not going to ask you that many questions. Let's, let's <laughs> onboard you. And, um, you know, don't tell me if you're, you know, have ties to a marijuana related business. Well, that's a really good way to get in trouble. Right. And it's right. a terrible way to partner with someone, right? right? Like just, okay, just give us your money or, Hey, we'll, yeah. we'll give you the loan. So, um, you know, and we don't just worry. Really the, the content time. will be completely irrelevant to you that we mm -hmm. sent on a monthly yeah. basis. Right, yeah. exactly. You know, um, not too much to be worried about on the PPC side. Um, I, I clicked on your competitor and 
compare these headlines, right? Your headline, let me see if I, I can send this to you. Um, you guys are just nailing it because, again, your headline was hemp banking has challenges. We have solutions. The competitor that actually mentioned hemp in the ad says, tell us about your needs and let us do the legwork. It's like, okay, do I want to work with someone who I have to tell them about my needs because they don't know my needs and then they're going to help me? Of course, they're going to help me as they sell me. Or someone who says, yeah, there's challenges. We know about it and we've got solutions for all them. I'm back to your, your original point. You know, whatever it is, with hemp banking, the high volume, the SBA loans, whatever it is, yes, there are specific challenges to your specific situation, and we have specific solutions. And people are like, yes, sign me up. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, it's um, it's been a fun space to be a part of for sure. And I, you know, I've learned a lot about it, especially like in the beginning before COVID hit, and we were going to hemp banking conferences and just learning, you know, digging into the industry to be able to develop that, like, what is our message and like, how are we going to attract the right, you know, customers to the bank? So right. um, definitely, definitely awesome. fun stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm curious because you're doing so much, right. Um, it's really impressive landing pages and all that and SEO and the alignment documents. What keeps you up at night? What, what challenges, what concerns you are, you're, you're thinking about it. What's got you. <laughs> What's on high? Um, yeah, I would, I would guess, you know, the majority of the guests you have on this show probably say like attribution, right? Like that's like kind of the obvious one for, for marketers is like, you know, being able to really attribute like what worked and what didn't like, mm. you know, I could, I could go through the whole entire click process of a paid ad and get ready to make a phone call and then X out of my browser and then go home and pick up the phone and call. It's like, right. you would never be able to like <laughs> right. put those two together. You like heard it attribution. on a podcast referencing yeah. an Instagram ad. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's the obvious one. I think that's going to be a struggle for years for marketers. Um, the guy that figures it out, man, I want to meet him or her, right? Yeah. Like that, whoever has the keys to that kingdom, that would be, um, that would be really cool. So I don't want to, I don't want to say that I would, you know, I would say that it's, what keeps me up at night is um, the fact that marketers are expected to be innovative, but also at the same time, be the ones that have to order pens and lanyards and, and do all of that kind of stuff. Like it's two very different things that, you know, are, you're, are, are expected of you. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, as marketers are wearing enough hats, right. Doing SEO, user experience design, social media, content, you know, helping market for events and developing handouts and one pagers, right? I mean, you're working with sales to do this stuff. You're working with HR to do business yeah. cards. You're working with IT to help them with their software and how things are designed in that. So, um, you know, the fact that people expect marketers to be innovative and do all these other things, it's, it's kind of like makes your head spin because yeah. like you could have a chief innovation officer, arguably at every company today right? Just the way things are heading and the way things are changing. Like you should always be trying to innovate, right? I think it was a McKinsey study that, um, you know, talked about the average lifespan of a company on the fortune 500 list. It used to be 60 years, like, you know, 30, 40 years ago, something like that. Present day, it's like 15 years, right? And then this study estimates that by 2030, it's going to be five years. So if you think about all of this ruckus, like how things are being shaken up by some of the most credible, uh, uh, largest companies, you know, on the Fortune 500 list, and all this change, I mean, how we consume is changing so quickly, mm. right? I mean, Netflix knows exactly what show I want to watch before I've even had time to think about what show I want to watch. <laughs> I mean, that is that to me is crazy. Um, and user experience obviously is changing too with like things like Amazon. I mean, you can get something delivered on your door like the next day. Yeah, so it's true. all of these, this change at this level, you've got um, the, how we market is going to change obviously because like the consumer behavior and user experience, like that's marketing. So um, it's changing very, very fast and it's very applicable to marketing and the innovation cycle. And I think it's only going to get more intense. So going back to, having to innovate when you've got all this unknown in the future and also having to just put a logo on pens. So 
that to me is um, kind of what keeps me up at night because I want to make sure that we're, you know, we're doing our job and doing everything that's expected of us. But I also, you know, kind of know where things should be heading kind of like as far as the innovative innovation goes. Definitely. I would say the second thing too, oh, like, sorry. No. Yeah. Preach. <laughs> um, you know, content accountability, right? Like, especially in financial services, you know, once content is out there, it's out there. Um, and from a compliance standpoint, just like making sure that every, you know, our message is aligned with compliance and there aren't, aren't any typos, right? Because you know, doing lots of different content for lots of different entities, lots of right. different um, departments, it's just, it doesn't necessarily get, keep me up. It's not like I'm sitting in bed at night, but it's something that <laughs> right. is just like, it's time consuming to make sure that it is like there, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And so people have to be listening, you know, with a critical ear for these kind of things. It, it does add an extra layer of execution, at least to, you know, your already busy day, right? You just need, especially if you want to execute, you know, I even find even at big companies, it can be hard because um, for like the larger corporations, sometimes it feels like you're punching jello. You're trying to move something forward and there's just so many people you've got to, you know, talk to and get approval from and all and they just have you know the health care and the financial side has just that much more of those tick marks that have to be checked to make sure things are copacetic right right gotcha totally you know with your with your your first uh that first point um going back to that one it's like the breadth it's the range of things that marketing can do and i remember chatting about this on a webinar recently it's like the only department that really spans everything right at some point Sales does want to talk to you. At some point, they don't want to talk to you anymore um, unless they're like a client relationship. But then there's like finance. Marketing tends to want to, in, you know, look at the entire journey when it can. It right. has the ability to do that. And no one else is really with their head up enough to look beyond my cubicle or my group of cubicles and my particular function area. Everyone else gets to kind of focus. So there's, a, there's like something relaxing or calming about being able to focus now that been in marketing and you realize wow there's so many things i could tackle um whereas sales knows i got a number i gotta hit i gotta make some calls like let's go um finance we gotta get this collected we gotta get this paid cool not to you know not to you know, say anything all these jobs are hard but at least there's there's singular focuses or a couple focuses as opposed to like you said one day you're trying to figure out how to innovate around a new banking arena for a new industry that's challenged like hemp another day you're making sure that the logo for the newly rebranded ifh you know is correct on the new pens used in the branch right. and like oh right. man right right i mean from your perspective casey do you think it is and it, it's it, i don't want it to come off like what is and what isn't marketing's job because every company is different right and there's so many different factors and things to think about but like would do you think it's marketing's job to send an email out to a mass audience anytime and every time. Like for example, you know, m majority of emails should be, you know, like driving new business, right? Trying to yeah. build brand as opposed to maybe sending out like an internal message or maybe sending out, you know, a message about an update to clients that are is specific to their loan, right? Like is it marketing's job to always be the one putting a message together, regardless of whether or not it's driving new business, just for, in your opinion? Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, it's a challenge, right? Because you can you can sort of like take over more and more responsibility that might be maybe takes you away from that that primary focus of driving business, driving revenue. I think there's something to that, but being grounded in whether it's new or existing business, you know. Um, repeat business is the new <laughs> lead gen these days, but whether it's new or existing business, there's something grounding about associating with revenue because when you, when you lose that, you really kind of lose your footing and then you can find yourself floating in a world of branding and you're the first to go. You know, like, like historically happens when, you know, there's a downturn, there's a recession, there's something you're, you're the ax. Cause we can, we can do without branding for a moment right. and think, but we can't do without getting new business in, in a time like this, we need more business as possible, you know, as much as possible. So right. I like the idea of like keeping a foot or a rope attached to the platform of new and existing business. Um, 
but then I mean, that that recurring business or the existing business is a slippery slope because it talks yeah. to customer experience. And I think a lot of the larger or the growing organizations start peeling off things from marketing to say like, okay, customer experience, customer success, you're kind of communicating around a specific area. So that way marketing doesn't have to necessarily do that communication, but maybe they still own it. Maybe, maybe it's several divisions under marketing, you know, which right. is, which is not to say that helps when you're like the one or two marketers in, in a company that's growing. Mm -hmm. No, totally. And I, I'm completely with you that like anything that someone's going to open up and read, regardless of who it is, I think there needs to be a thoughtful message there. And yeah. that's, that is marketing. So I'm with you. I can just kind of see both sides to the coin. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I mean, is the logo on a pen important? Will that drive business? Probably. Now, right. yeah. but it, it's almost like you need to do something that probably you're, you'd be even better at. Just You could do some like really interesting modeling in Excel to be like, okay, what is the, the, the fraction of a percent of influence that pen has if I right. see it every day? You that know, would be a cool like a study, right? Like, yeah. hey, a hemp business picks up a pen off the street. What are the chances that they see West Ham Bank? Hemp Bank's here. And then they're, they're making a phone call. Right. We're at a conference, immediately. Yeah. Right. right. I mean, that's, associate that's a, pen back with that conference. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, I, I think we, we kind of inherently know there's something to branding just from our experience on the B2C side. It's almost like we, we borrow notions and strategies, maybe for better or worse from the B2C side in the B2B world and, and vice versa. And so there's this sort of understanding that the best brands, you know, just command, you know, the situation. Um, mm -hmm. but you're right. No. It's, it's not a quick, it's not a quick return. It, if I had 90 days to prove myself as a marketer, I, I love, I'm taking a page out of your book. I'm going hardcore SEO. I'm, I'm doing these things that you talked about. I'm probably not doing what a lot of marketers do when they first get there, which is we need to redesign the website. We need to order more pens. We need to do this and that. And that's just, that's a, that's a scary bet to place because you're basically placing a bet of you don't have any control over any of this stuff and you're not driving anything. Mm -hmm. um, super scary approach. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think designing the website is, you know, it, it definitely important because if you're going to like, I mean, all roads lead to the website, especially with digital marketing. I mean, you want, you Good want point. something pretty to look at prior to really saying, Hey, us as marketers, come look at me. Right. Like, right. um, like having just that in place. So just, just Good that point. part of it is, is something I would, you know, want to think about, but yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, just the perception of what marketing is is so different and you might have one, you know, person at a community bank saying, well, it's their job to create koozies and find the events that we need to go to. And right. Oh man. Speaking of koozies, have you, have you seen <laughs> things? <laughs> have you ever heard that before? Speaking, Speaking of koozies. Okay. No, no. It's this thin little piece of plastic. I got it from um, a good friend, former podcast producer here, Triangle. Okay. These guys put out this little, little, uh, it's like a little piece of plastic, right? You got to get these <laughs> because I got these and I was like, okay, cute. Thanks for a little piece of plastic. They, they're used for a cup, um, like a little cup, uh, like what do you yeah. call it? A cup, uh, a coaster. mug. They're like, yeah. coaster, like a mug. Yeah. Coaster, right. Yeah. yeah. But also when you're trying to open that stupid bottle for the misses and even your brute strength doesn't do it. Cause your hands are slipping. You place mm -hmm. this thing down on top and you're like, pop opens yeah. up. Yeah. And it looks like that's a that's a credit union that's on there, right? Yeah, it's a little credit union. Gosh, Shout you know what? Them. Now now this whole podcast is shot because I talked about how like there's this idea of what's your job and what isn't. Like that's effective right there. Now Triangle Credit Union's got some good marketing too. So Shout I mean out. this is like right. I mean, this is this is like I was completely wrong. <laughs> like everything we should be doing is, you know, centered around koozies and cups and coasters and <laughs> you know, the only challenge is I had to use it to understand like how important this thing is. But now, now I'm like, I got to get CM. I just going to order some yeah. for Cheshire impact just so I can have some. Right. <laughs> well, uh, but, we'll but yeah, but if you list. got it, you'd be like, Oh, just another one of those like stupid swag things. But then you don't realize how this one's actually <laughs> stupid <laughs> <and> helpful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I want to like make a list of all the like swag I've gotten at all the conferences over the years of like stuff that I actually use versus stuff. Right. I just like threw in the trash as soon as I got home. Cause it's right. like, okay, we should just, always be do like you know if, especially if you're like giving it that's actually a good idea like put together a template or some sort of like matrix for when people ask like 
department heads. I'm going to this conference. Can we order this material? Well, okay, here's, you know, you know, good stuff. Here's bad stuff, right? Let's do a vote. Let's do like a, just mm -hmm. kind of figuring out what those go-to items are. Cause that's a question I asked them. I'm like, well, what do you want? Okay. Uh, I don't know. Can you tell me? And I'm like, okay. Like, it's just, it, that's just another way to maybe help people you know, along there. Totally. Right. Shout out to Elizabeth for giving me a couple of these things. Um, it's great under, under pots at the table, uh, like anything. So you, it's anyways, what do you have a go-to? I mean, as dumb as it is, this is mine. <laughs> you know, the, the most successful thing we did was, uh, as far as, you know, conference giveaways, yeah. we went to a hemp, hemp conference last year and we did a, um, hemp banks here. That's something we re recently trademarked. We had, uh, hemp hats, hats that were made out of hemp, oh, um, nice. like these trucker hats that we had, you know, and people huh. all in the hemp industry, like, this is so cool. And, you know, then you start talking about like all the different things that you can make out of hemp with like fiber. And it's not just like the CBD oils that are important. Right. Yeah. CBD is oh, wow. right now, like the I boom, but like there's hundreds of different things that you can make out of hemp. Um, so then you start talking about that. It's a good conversation starter and people liked them. They were slick. Yeah. I'm looking at it right now. It looks good. I could see that, especially the story behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whenever you get that, oh, wow, that's that's how you know you've hit something where people are like, oh, neat. And they're going to pay attention to it. Um, I think avoid the teddy bears for sure. Right? <laughs> because yeah. I will literally go over and get scanned and I'll ask for a second and you're going to it's going to be hard for you to say no to me. Mm -hmm. Can I get another one? You scan me for my two kids. Right. I'm bringing them home for the two kids. Right. I, I'm going to unsubscribe from you on Monday. <laughs> 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 like you know I'll, yeah, I'll just give me what i like want yeah, yeah. What, what do you need from me to to so i can get what i want and then right right <laughs> part ways yeah what, what about a raffle you ever you know those raffles you know sometimes i'll try to play a trick on them and just you know i'll, I'll have like a two-minute conversation with a sales rep and like oh yeah i've got like a i've got a million dollar budget on this next project i really hope uh <laughs> i really hope yeah. i win the raffle <laughs> right right no i think uh i've actually never done raffles but um and i've never really been like super intrigued by like seeing one at a conference i think right. like when you've been to enough conferences you're just kind of like you know the the cool item is like like few and far between as yeah. far as like running into something that's like oh go to this booth and then they all get taken and then it's like yeah. okay well so i don't know i just haven't been you know that hasn't really been what has gotten me on the hook <laughs> yeah but yeah um know. for my group we once did a uh this is a different company i was it was a software company and we we're doing a trade show at dreamforce uh doing a booth there very interesting experience to do that very expensive um but we get these little like um, wristbands that had like thumb drives on them. Um, it's funny, even these days we're like, ah, everything's in the cloud and everything. Yeah. Until you need to get your presentation on a laptop at a conference. And they're like, do you have a thumb drive? You're like, I haven't carried one of those in like years, but at the time, and this was, I guess it was probably six or seven years ago, but it was like wristband thumb drive. And we pop, we'd, I'd like walk out to people and put it on their wrist, you know? Yeah. Instead yeah. of dropping in their bag, because you just drop in their bag, it's like gone. Instead, I yeah. put it right there on their wrist, and they're like, "Oh, oh that's like cool." That. Yeah. You know? Um, but but we ran out of those, and so mm -hmm. we like went to Target for the last day, and we just got, I don't know, a million thousand peppermint patties, and those are just <laughs> those are just clutch in the right time. Yeah. It's yeah. like who doesn't want a peppermint patty? You walk a around. million thousand of them, especially right. Yeah, I and mean... they're like little small ones. You're not feeling like, oh, I'm cheating or something. You're like, yeah, I, I could, yeah do with one of those i mean no yeah. now that i think about it, i mean food is probably the best way to to bribe people right i mean yeah. that's like the gifts you get at the end of the year around like the holidays like you know peanuts and chocolate and um you know from different clients and vendors so like food's definitely uh, a good way to win my um you know to, to get my attention right. but all this talk too it's like making me actually like really want to go back to conferences like it, i feel like it's like it's been it's only been over like you know coming up on a year now but yeah, it feel it doesn't it kind of feel like it's been like a decade, like it seems foreign, it really like does. it just it's interesting. Do you think when um, well, I'll ask you, do you have any any sense for when they come back? I mean, have you planned uh, this year? You know, we're do we're partaking in a virtual one here pretty soon. Um, the North Carolina Industrial Hemp Association, you know, we're going to do like a little video of like talking about different stakeholder talking to different stakeholders about why hemp banks here 
right? Like from the president's perspective, from the compliance officer's perspective, and we're gonna be sharing that at a virtual event coming up here. Um, I mean, that's really the only thing that I've even talked about uh, as far as what's on the radar. And, yeah. you know, that's just a big one for us, right? I mean, the bank is based in Raleigh, North Carolina. So, I mean, being part of that and like, I don't know how many attendees are going to be going to something that's virtual versus in person, but it's still st something you want to presence at. And aside from that, I don't really know um, when, right? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I wish I had a crystal ball and wish I could say, you know, this date conferences will be, you know, kicking back up, but wait and see game, wait and see approach with, with that. You know, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical about the virtual events. Um, I love people. And I just love connecting. Um, and so I haven't really got the feel from it, even had a bad sense of it. Last year, there was this conference where in order to really have quality presentations, they had the presenters record them in advance and then just play them. And then it's like, what's different between this and just me watching your recorded webinar? Why do I have to show up on Tuesday at 4 p.m.? I really don't. And then if that's the case, is this really an event? It's not, it's like, you know, and then there was like virtual booths you could visit. So it's just like, ugh, I, I oh, it's tough sort of like adapting and trying to just find ways of doing it. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I, I also wonder if when it, when it does come back, if we're all like super jonesing to get back to like a lot of us to get back to these in-person events. And yet when we get there, in order to have had these early events take place, there's going to be so many regulations, kind of like we were talking about with finance and healthcare, that it's going to be weird. It's going to not even feel like a normal event that we're used to going to because there's going to be so many like plastic walls, if if anything, you know? Right. No, that's a really good point. And, you know, it, it's just part of going to a conference or an event too. I think like, it's just like having a drink at the bar after the yeah. events and connecting with someone like, and that's something you're, you're totally missing out on and losing obviously with the virtual concept and right. stuff that's like pre-recorded. Um, so, I mean, it's and some more irony, right? Like where you have, everything is so digital and it's more effective to be digital, but yeah. here's a really good example where it's like, digital is not really the way to, uh, make these events or max maximize these events. I'm, I'm with you on it. Um, you know, not to say that like, you know, you, you might, you know, learn something from an educational conference or like see names or get people's emails, right? There's still some, some things there that uh, could certainly be valuable. It's just, uh, you yeah. know, it's different. I'm actually, um, do you know, have you know the hustle? There's like a email newsletter. No, no. You heard of that? You should totally check it out. I'm a fit. I don't really subscribe to, I unsubscribe from most things. <laughs> But the hustle, um, it's it's kind of like a tech newspaper kind of thing. But it, and they just sort of they curate the heck out of it, and they just it's once a day you get this update. It's free, and it's got a lot of the latest news or interesting things that are happening. And you're like, oh, cool. Um, so I've been a fan of that, and, and I had a chance to have Steph um, Smith from there um, on the podcast, but also um, do a webinar just sort of chatting about. She what she did is she she's basically an analyst and she's looked at the future, and she, in a way, I feel like she's almost like a little more pessimistic than I am. So I like I appreciate. I'm like, oh, the flowers and the skies, and she's like, well, historically speaking, this may not be the case. And so I really appreciated her insight. And so she's actually presented to several groups on what the future looks like. And this was last year, and you know what it looks like, um, the different influences. And so I actually I pinged her and. Um, and we're going to do like a little, we're just going to do like a private meeting if you're interested where it's, uh, we're going to have her and a couple other people talk about what she sees historically and also um, from all the different indicators of when she thinks events will be back in person. Kind of Interesting. Like, yeah, no, I, that yeah. sounds awesome. Um, okay, cool. Wow. Like we'll this is, this, this girl sounds great. She's like a genie with a, you know, crystal Super ball genie. knows exactly when everything's going to happen. Genie. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the, I'll send you, there's a, a slide deck she presented um, previously, but one of the things she was showing is um, if, if you were struggling before this, you'd probably go out of business. If you were um, doing great before this, you may or may not. And there's like this whole matrix chart, but she, but but the question is, if, but if you can do great during this, then you come out of it, you'll be better. And there was this whole decision tree she was showing, and it really got you thinking about, you know, planes and industries 
Right. And, you know, the, even the idea with, with hemp, it's interesting because if, if you're doing great now, then as this thing opens up, it, it can open up even more so. And so anyway, she, she just gets me thinking outside the box. So I'll definitely mm-hmm. loop mm-hmm. you on that. And, you know, with the different rounds of PPP funds, it made me think about, um, you know, the Paycheck Protection Program. Like- totally. Windsor Advantage under the holding company obviously did a lot of those for banks and credit unions and Westtown Bank, you know, did a lot of PPP loans for its its business customers, but seeing the different rounds kind of get rolled out, all the rules change, and then just the volume that has kind of like gone down as the rounds have, you know, changed. It's like, well, is that because businesses are like now off the streets and going out of business or is it because the rules changed and they aren't? you know, leveraging it the second time around for a second draw, like kind of makes you think like what's going on with like the bigger picture of how businesses are performing. Um, interesting. It'd be interesting to see that matrix. Yeah. I know we didn't, we didn't qualify for the second one. We qualified for the first one though. 25% yeah. reduction in revenue wasn't there for a quarter or something. That's where, right. you know, at least I've talked to a lot of people. That's where, you know, the n- not being able to qualify for yeah. the second yeah, draw. It's, would, it's interesting. Would Just in, different. So. Yeah, different requirements or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, crazy. Oh, last thing. Have you heard of Clubhouse? Clubhouse? No, Clubhouse. I'm just writing down all these things you're telling me to check yeah, out. I've yeah, got yeah. homework to do, Casey. So <laughs> Clubhouse, uh, it's a new app. There's a good BuzzFeed article on it um, and Mashable article on it. Um, it's. Do you have an iPhone? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll yeah. send you an invite. It's invite only. Okay. A- anyone listening? <laughs> <laughs> send me uh, a note twitter email whatever yeah, yeah. Uh, and i get you an invite too um but the more you do it and the more you use it the more invites you get but essentially what it is it's like it's like a social media platform it's like twitter but it's all audio so they're kind of like party lines from the 70s is the best way i can describe it where you log in you see a bunch of rooms that are happening based on who you're connected to and you can join a room and just listen or you can raise your hand and they can promote you to the stage where you can speak okay. with everyone else. And it's almost like panel discussions, though panel yeah. sounds boring, but it's right. like, there's all these impromptu panel discussions about anything. Right. Uh, that's, anything from, that's a really, yeah. that's really interesting. Cause you know, I've, you know, you hear all this stuff too. I, I want to stay very out of the political aspect of it, but like fake news and what people say or what people comment on is like, is that real or not? Right. Or yeah. is that credible? Like, it's almost like if you're being called on, it's like, what if it was like, okay, what this person's about to say is credible because here's the source or it's like someone behind the scenes is actually able to say like, this is, this is believable. I think that would attract a lot of flies, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, as far as just being able to get a truthful message out there. And I don't know, that's just an idea that, you know, popped into my head and thinking about being called on, um, you know, speaking of like different tools and, and apps, do you guys ever use Power BI, Microsoft Power BI? For no, no, I hear about anything? it all the time though. No, because yeah, it's, it's some of our banks um, or at Windsor have, have used it. And um, I kind of think it's like the future of, of content. And I, I'm really, you know, attracted to it and how you interact with content, right? Like putting something into Excel and then having interactive charts and content. I don't know if you've like seen those maps where you can like scroll over different states and like see the data, right? Um, That's something I've wanted to experience with as far as just like, you know, tools and different software and getting that, you know, to be part of our content pretty consistently. I think that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, the visualization aspect of that. Well, it's a big word. Let's be early. In the visualization aspect visualization of is um, <laughs> Mouthful. powerful. Yeah. When you can just show data in a different way, not in a spreadsheet, mm-hmm. but actually in a different, different format. Right. Make say it though, interactive. Man, who are you? I, I got to we, We've worked together for a bit. I mean, I'm having a blast chatting with you. Who are you? Can you take me back to like little you days when you're growing up? You know, where'd yeah. you grow up? What was it like? Did you always know you're going to be in banking and marketing <laughs> and sales and all these things? Never, never. No, I grew up in the Midwest, um, was the oldest of three boys. And, um, you know, (laughs) as far as like who I am and what I did growing up, it's interesting because just this past holiday, we were watching, you know, family movies and man, I was, (laughs) I was really type A as far as like how I interacted with my brothers, like very bossy. For yeah, a guy nice. that really had no special talents or anything special about him. <laughs> like I'm just telling him what to do in all these videos. And um, so oldest of three boys, uh, grew up in the Midwest. 
Um, like what state? You... Uh, Minnesota and Indiana. Oh, wow. So, um, okay. Yeah. And then I, in, Min- in Minneapolis, I went to a military high school, all male Catholic. A military high school? Military high school. Were you being punished uh, or was that, a, was that something uh, you asked to do? You know, going back to my dad, <laughs> he right. went to a military high school um, okay. in Indiana growing up. So I, um, there was one in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis that my parents explored and said it was the right thing for me. And, and you know, I was never like the best student, right? I mean, I always got like my, my 3-0 that my parents said I, I needed to get, but, you know, <sighs> looking back at it, I, you know, under, understanding the importance of grades and how I'm going to raise my kids. It's like, I really should have been a little bit more applied, like applied myself as a student. Um, and then went to college at Miami of Ohio. Um, you know, so, uh, that going back to, you know, never being the, the best student, I, you know, originally was a business major and then dropped out and pursued a communication degree, got out in four years, um, then moved to Chicago and, uh, really started my career on the financial services side of, of selling mm. worked at JP Morgan Chase yep smile and dial selling investments um, then went into commercial banking did some credit analyst training programs sold treasury management products and cash management solutions to you know on the b2b side of things and then got hired at Windsor and that's where I kind of started to get my marketing exposure right yeah, that was that's interesting. A business development as a small company and it was sales and marketing that I was responsible for. So I learned like the importance of marketing and, and how to market. And that was just, you know, a few years ago. So I've, you know, haven't been doing marketing my entire professional career over the last decade. It's really, you know, fairly new over the last three or four years. Um, as far as really making that, you know, something that is like who I am as a professional. Right. So. Wow. Well, you know what you're, and what your output that you've shown, even, you know, that we've talked about even today is like top notch for not having done it, you know, all your life. And you know, to have SEO results that quickly to even understand or look into SEO is, is impressive for a sales guy. Well, it, um, <laughs> I think part, well, I appreciate that. Um, but I think part of it too was like, if I had to go back and tell myself like one thing the day I graduated, right. That, like, wait, wait, wait. Are you, are you hopping to my mystical, magical? Well, question? that was like, because now I'm thinking about it, right? And it's like, well, how did you do it? It's <laughs> like, well, it was like, know the importance of rolling up your sleeves and like just figuring something out, right? Because I think one of the pitfalls of like early on in my career, being at a larger corporation or organization, I mean, they don't really tell you like how to, you know, it, it's it's just such a cog in the wheel approach and going to a smaller organization, you know, I, you know, you'd stay up late, like late researching SEO and like being very hands-on and watching YouTube videos Mm -hmm. and figuring out. And like, I realized that's how I learn. So you just got to like roll up your sleeves and figure it out. And um, that's how I learned quickly, as opposed to just kind of like going through the motions at a big company. So um, I think that's what I would attribute, like just picking up on it. Right. Um, just like you got to put it into action to understand it. Um, as opposed to just like having someone tell you about it or go through a training program. Yeah. It's so true. You got to put it in action to really learn the thing. Mm -hmm. It's so true. Yeah. Um, I didn't mean to steal your, I didn't mean to steal your question. No, no, all good, man. (laughs) Hey, it flows, you know, I feel a podcast coming in your future. Uh, uh oh, uh oh. Podcast. Um, you can be my <laughs> first thing. guest. You can be the first guest. Thank you. <laughs> yes, it'd be fun. Um, though I don't know too much other than what you've just told me about SBA loans, but this is this is cool. This is, maybe yeah. I should. Maybe I should. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if if you're wanting to learn about them, right? I mean, it's just right? it's very niche. I don't know how exciting they would be for you. Right? Seriously. But, um, yeah. To, I mean, require a lot of collateral too, don't they? What's that? SBA loans, they like require collateral or something? Um, Actually, they are typically under collateralized, which is why they kind of fall into that SBA segment, right? Because if a bank's going to do a traditional commercial loan and it's collateralized, it's a lot safer. But a bank or a business might cash flow well, and so they'd be credit worthy to to get a loan in the eyes of the SBA. So this program, but they might not have the collateral or the assets to back it if the loan ever went bad. So that's where the government steps in and says, these businesses need loans to grow, but they don't have the collateral. 
they can cash flow. So Smart. make the loan. Yeah. And we're just learning stuff all over the place here. I know. I know. It's fun stuff. It's fun Dang. stuff. Of, of like the, you know, 200 plus people you've had on the show, like what's the best piece of advice you've gotten? Like speaking of learning mm. that you've gotten from someone or learned or like thinking back on it that you're like, gosh, that was, that was really interesting. And I still kind of use that or think about it today. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that when I ask people what they would tell themselves in the past, you know, the advice you'd give yourself, no one has said like, don't take that job or, or avoid that relationship or, you know, I should have done a different major or whatever. It's almost like everyone recognizes that it was those experiences that taught them and that journey, wherever they had to go through, they ended up where they're at now. And that, they're like better because of it, you know? So no right. one's like asked, no one's tried to avoid a situation, you know, don't date that gal. Like it's a mistake. <laughs> it was just like, they, they tell themselves to, to, um, they, they can, they, they're always encouraging themselves. Right. And they're giving themselves right. advice, rolling up your sleeves. Like in, in like also a lot of, it's just like, you got this. I think we, we don't give ourselves enough credit. It's like, no, you got this. You, you can do this. You're, you'll be fine. You'll be great. And hearing our future self tell us that is awesome. And tied yeah. to that, I've often That's heard so the, cool. the advice um, that um, you, you want to make your future self proud, um, but also uh, f like look back on like yourself a year ago and like, and, you know, have like mercy and forgiveness of yourself. You didn't know certain things. Right. Um, and so you, but you want to make future, you look back on you right now and be like, I'm proud of you and being proud mm -hmm. of yourself. But like that person looking back being like, I'm proud of you. Like you really worked. You didn't have to do this. You didn't have to skip that or do that workout or get that new job or take that risk, but you did. And because of what you did today, 10 years from now, a person is just like enjoying amazing success. Thanks to what you did today. Wow, that's really cool. And I love that that answer applies to like a general way that people answer your, you know, million dollar question, right? And yeah. Like, it's not just like one piece of advice, but it's like, it's how you perceive the different types of answers. And gosh, that that is interesting, right? I mean, you, you've kind of got two different, you know, ways to give yourself advice, right? It's like, hey, what would you have done differently? if you could, or like, what's like reflective, right? Yeah. Like when you, you know, you, you ask that and it's like, okay, well, I'm going to reflect back on it. And what have I realized that's happened between now and that time, which is, you know, one of the things for me, it's like, there's something to learn from everyone along the way yeah. in your professional career. It's true. Like every single person. And it's either good or bad, right? You could say, I know I've had this manager and I know how I don't want to manage. Right. Or, sure. Um, sure. you know, I see how this person comes into the office every single day at this time and they leave every day at this time, right? Like I want to be more disciplined about like when I plug in and when I plug out. Um, mm -hmm. There's just something to learn from everyone because I, you know, thinking about that, thinking about the different jobs and who I've been around and different managers I've had it's, it's really cool um, to think about that because now I'm not going to miss out on that, like going forward, right? Like that's something I want to do, yeah. you know, as you continue to throttle forward with your professional career, which is like, talk to everyone around you. Like, don't, don't, you know, put your head in the sand and just like ignore people or be like, well, that person doesn't talk much. Like just learn about them and ask them about like their jobs, their responsibilities, like what, what keeps them up at night. <laughs> yeah. you know it's interesting too yeah. um just learning from others it's such a such a cool thing there's some humility to it right and and i found with the podcast um uh sometimes there's this ego check without a podcast there's an ego check of like do i want to learn from this person or does that make me feel worse about myself if i'm learning from this person mm -hmm. um, and there's some sort of confidence around being like it's okay i really want to learn from and the idea of being you know you've heard this like be the don't be the smartest person in the room. Like try right. to be maybe not the dumbest, but like <laughs> someone who's trying to learn. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that takes some, some ego as well to like put that in check and be like, you yeah, know, I really, cause it's not necessarily, they don't, they don't say the second part, which is 
it's not always fun or easy or anything if you aren't the smartest person. Like if you are struggling to be there, that's a lot of work. No one mentions right. that part. They're like, oh yeah, don't right. be the smartest person in the room. Yes, it'll be embarrassing. Yes, you'll feel like an idiot. Like, but it'll tell you where you can go to, you know? Right, um, right. I think yeah. I think looking back on this, the title of it should be, you know, don't be the smartest person in the room, but don't be the dumbest person <laughs> of the podcast. Like, this is like, I love that. Like, it's like, hey, just find that middle ground. But yeah. Um, no, totally. I think is that right next to your name? So it's like, hey, yeah, hey, yeah. Hey. Don't not, not the, the smartest, dumbest, but not the not dumbest. The smartest. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I totally love being surrounded by um, you know, people that are smarter than me. It just yeah. like it it challenges you too to be better, right? Um, so I'm I'm with you on that. It's I think about that with social all the time, right? So um I'm not so into Facebook these days because there's just a lot of noise. Um, but I often think about, you know, they, they talk about you become like the five friends you spend the most time with, right? You just, it's net, people you spend the most time with at work, anywhere, whoever you spend the most time with, you borrow from their behaviors and their actions and their, how they operate. And, and I wonder about just the image hits. If you're just scrolling by Facebook and you just have, you know, the lazy people or the people that are angry or the people that are this and all, and, and maybe you might feel better about yourself. Cause you're like, oh, these guys are so distracted. How angry, but like there it's an impression on you. So I, I've like, I use a lot of Instagram and I curate that thing. Like it's not necessarily everyone, you know, like on Facebook, you feel weird if you're not connected to people and you're like, oh, I'm saying no to them. But on Instagram, it's like my little curated piece of heaven. You know, it's like people working out, uh, people climbing mountains. It's, it's the woods. It's, it's rock. Climbing. It's yeah. like my little happy thing, but it's also people like some like fitness people and rock climbers and mountaineers that are like way beyond me. And, and I don't feel that sort of negativity of like, Oh, I'm not in their perfect life. I'm like, I'm a, I'm surrounded constantly by these people who are kicking serious ass. And, right. and it, and it says, okay, I gotta make sure I'm stepping up to the plate, you know, and not. Right. Yeah, you know, no, it, totally. And it's how you perceive it. Cause that's like, yeah, it's exactly it. Like in the, you know, I don't know if you've seen like the social dilemma, but it's like, not yet. People, and they talk that? about, yeah, they talk about the negativity mm. that our feeds are so curated to what we want to see and what we want to believe. Yeah. That it becomes this world of like fantasy. Right. But like, yeah. and, and people feel like they need to maybe compete with people that are like them or, you know, are doing things or have similar hobbies and they need to be like, they need to compete or be better or like, you know, I'm not doing it the right way because this person does it that way kind of mentality versus looking at it and say, well, it's like the idea of being, hey, I know I'm not the smartest in the room. This is so cool. This is going to make me better that you're yeah. saying, you know, you get on Facebook and you're like, I see these mountain climbers and I see, you know, how much ass they're kicking. And like, you know, I don't know if you've climbed Mount Everest, but like, if you see someone climb Mount Everest, then you're like, I want to be like that. <laughs> like, I want to do that. Like, let's make that a yeah. goal, man. Like, let's not let's not like pout about it because someone else is doing it better than me, but um, right. like that's, it's perception. So that's, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's like cool to be competitive, but there's certain things maybe in business, but if you let it get to you, like you're trying to, someone's always going to be, I've heard this, like someone will always have more money than you, but there'll be people who have less money than you or more this or less that mm -hmm. it's so relative. So if you make that the game, you're constantly chasing a carrot that you'll never catch, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. It's a, it's a vicious cycle for sure. For sure. Totally, man. Good, as, stuff. good as, question. See, you, yeah, you're already I've asking another, good questions. I've got another one for you, actually. I yeah. know I'm turning the tables here a bit, but like as, as an entrepreneur, um, you know, started Cheshire Impact, what was like, what kept you up at night in the beginning stages specifically of like starting a company and like growing it and like all the stresses that come along with that? Like what was like the biggest stress for you? Yeah. Um, everything that happened negatively, I associated it with it ending the company, like it would take it out. Um, and you know, a lot of businesses end, right? Like they don't usually survive. A lot of them end. Um, but at the same time, uh, business, if, if it's, if it's sales are good and the team is delivering, it's a lot more stable than, than you think it is, right? So I was kind of this sort of like nervous person. Um, and maybe that was, that was good. So you don't even know, like looking back, maybe it was good, maybe it wasn't. But like, I, I would constantly have my coaches and mentors saying like, 
no, 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 this, this doesn't take you out. Like, yes, this is a challenge. You have to address it. There's always going to be challenges. There's no perfect thing. Um, but you, so you need to address this, but it, it doesn't take you out. So I've gotten calmer over the years realizing, okay, this is not good, but we'll figure right. it out. Right. Key person right. leaves like, or, or, um, you know, letters from attorneys and, or, you know, you have a customer that goes out of business and you get right. that letter that I can recognize now that says, okay, they're in this next phase of their life. And, yeah. um, and so I've sort of tied to that was just, you kind of get desensitized and, and you kind of think as you're building it, that the bigger it gets, maybe just maybe you'll build enough processes around it so that you don't have those conflicts or challenges sure, um, or those, those attacks, if you will. But come right. to find out, and I even have learned this from other mentors too, um, the problems get harder and the consequences get harsher and it, it all gets worse. You just are desensitized to it as you climb up, as you grow. So yeah. the, little, the tiniest thing I used to say that like, I would, I would close the company down as soon as like someone tried to sue us and it was like BS, you know, I'd be right. like, I'm out. This is ridiculous until you get to that situation. You realize, no, like I, I have a duty to protect mm -hmm. the family here and the team. Here. Right. I don't need to do that. Right. Um, and, and all the hard work everyone's put into it. Yeah. And it's like, so if you had to go back and tell yourself, like when you were starting it, it's like, Hey, the world isn't ending. If something bad happens, we'll, we'll get yeah. through it. We'll figure yeah. it out yeah it's really it's all cool. about people yeah yeah it's not yeah you have good people on the team um then then you can get you can get through challenges you know so that's why i've been telling people right. now it's just that hey challenges happen we'll figure it out we'll get mm -hmm. through it you know and we'll, we'll make changes and we'll move on um yeah you look back at like albums of teams from the years and the different cohorts and you just like look back fondly on these like family photos of the team it's like hey some people come in some people will leave and it's okay like to have these things happen um but you you get you look more zen as you go but then what happens is you get cool with like whatever challenge level you're at and then more weird stuff happens you're like, ah, i'm at the next level now because like yeah first stuff is happening to me but oh um, man figure it out you know yeah very cool very cool well um you know cheshire's been an awesome company for us to work with and uh you know, it's, it's fun to hear your story a little bit too. So I didn't yeah. want to make it all uh, about me. Wanted to get a couple of those questions in there. Yeah. So get those, those questions in, man. That, yeah. That's that's a sign of a, a good conversation when everyone just yeah. is bringing their questions to the, the table. So for sure, for sure. Good stuff. So, Hey, where can people, how can they connect with you? If they want to reach out, pick your brain, try to get, um, try to get you to yeah. send them PDF. <laughs> Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, email or phone, email, um, a Schaefer at ifhinc.com. Um, you know, hit me up on LinkedIn, quick, uh, message that way always works. Um, so yeah, any, any and everything, you know, as, as a marketer, I keep all doors open and channels and read pretty much everything that comes through. Um, aside from some of the emails, like when it's just don't hit me up with like an automated email that looks very obvious, like high brackets um comma those are the ones that are like ooh, delete so um just make sure it's not automated because yeah. you get a lot of those yeah yeah if, if you're gonna reach out reach out say mm -hmm. something you know personal mention the podcast yeah. how you found them connect on linkedin stuff like that yeah for sure for sure so thanks again for uh for having me this has been uh, a lot of fun and learned a lot about you know you and this has just been uh really really cool topics to unpack and, and dig into yeah. Thanks, man. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming. And, you know, a good sign is when you look up at the clock and you're like, holy crap, where'd the time go? <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I, I just you know? looked down at it and I'm like, okay, wow. That's it's, you know, been over an hour and a half. So <laughs> right? thanks again. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Yeah. See, we'll have to have you come back once I get you on clubhouse, mm -hmm. we'll come back, <laughs> talk about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> clubhouse and hustle. Yep. Yes, I've, I've the, got those two. The hustle. Yeah. The hustle. I'll okay. send you a link for it. Okay. I've got yeah. an affiliate link. If I get enough people listening, they'll send me a hat and I just love hats. So, you know. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> you've got one on right now. That's I do. Awesome. I do. Yeah. It's my podcast hat. Okay. So, the lucky podcast hat. Yeah. It. Look, I mean, it's got yeah. the lucky uh, four leaf clover on there. And it's chesh yeah. colors too, you know, a little yeah. branding, little. Yeah. Are you yeah. Irish? Irish? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. Yeah. Next there time we're at a bar, I'm happy to prove it. <laughs> and, uh, it'll be good. Yeah. Drink well, lots awesome, of Guinness. Man. All yeah. right. Thanks again for coming on here. This is good. And uh, for sure, for those listening, this has been the Hardcore Marketing Show. Catch you all, all next right. time.